Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us here today at the Ballroom Blitz uh, for the discussion panel. And um, I'd just like to uh, inform you that uh, this talk is also being streamed uh, online on uh, DCGI's YouTube uh, channel. And um, we'll wait just for a few more people to come in. So uh, since uh, 2019, the Goethe Institute in Lebanon is implementing a program that is strengthening and empowering designers in Lebanon. Besides the will to promote creatives like that, designers are seen as potential change makers, enablers, and a huge source of inspiration and innovation in our society. And that is not only in an aesthetic way, but also in a societal meaning. Promoting designers also means promoting a big part of the local civil society. Fantasmim is part of a bigger initiative being implemented as well uh, by the Goethe Institute in Jordan, in which is known as Taqween. It's also implemented in Iraq. Uh, the initiative is known as Khan al Fan. And a couple of designers from both countries uh, may be present with us uh, tonight here at the event. The program is also implemented uh, in other countries in the world, like Kenya, Senegal, and South Africa. Um, I'd, I'd like you also to welcome with me uh, here in our on our stage the three panelists who are joining us for today's talk. Uh, we'll start by welcoming uh, Philippa Dahrouj. Philippa is a graphic designer. She's also a visual researcher and curator of This Is Not An Exhibition and This Is Not Beirut. We also have with us Sarah Rita Katan. Sarah is an architect and uh, an executive director at D4C, the Design for Communities NGO. She's also an educator and the vice chairperson at the World Organization of the Scout Movement. We also have with us Karim Nader. Karim is an architect, teacher, and a yogi. He is based in Beirut. Karim Nader Studio operates in Lebanon and worldwide. So um, just to introduce the main topic a bit before we start uh, with our talk. Now, while Lebanon was once referred to in the past as Switzerland of the East and Beirut as Paris of the, of the East, so much has changed since then. Lebanon has always been influenced by other cultures through trade uh, connections in the Mediterranean and by other countries that have colonized us. Colonized us. We evolved as a country that is strongly dependent on global and regional politics due to our strategic geographical position on the world map. Even our economic situation is mixed with our socio-political reality, which is itself mixed with the global system. With that in mind, today's panel talk t tackles sustainability with a focus on cultural colonialism and its effect directly on design and our design practice and as well on art, the local economy and society. Now, as we know, design is a philosophy. It's a practicality and a human right or need. It is used to shape one's own, own tools and environment. It's design that shaped this building, this room we are in, the chair you are sitting on, and the phones that you might, you might be using. The materials, all the materials that exist around us have been designed at some point. So uh, where did this material actually come from? Where did it come to service us? And what journey did it take? How long has it traveled in the economy? And do we actually have enough access to materials or not in Lebanon? And where is Lebanon when it comes to the circular economy? Where are we situated at? Until we circle back to the origin of this issue at hand, the design processes, products that we use, and their sustainability will reflect our ex-colonial policies. So today's talk will be divided into four sections. We will start first by defining what sustainability actually is for all of us. Then we will define cultural colonialism, and we'll also see, uh, we'll look at sustainability versus political power, and the challenges at, and tools that we have currently. 
I'd like to also mention, uh, before we start, that you can, using your mobile phones right now, if you wish, uh, whether now or uh, later during the talk, you can access uh, the Slido website. You have the details written um, on, the, on the wall here. Uh, so the website is called Slido, S-L-I-D-O dot com. And when you access it, you just enter the number that is written. It's um, 555-15944. And this is also an invitation for the audience that is watching us on the live stream. Uh, basically, we'll be asking you um, a few questions during the talk, and you can give us your opinion through this website. So you just enter the website, um, enter the code, and you can directly um, follow th the question and pick the, the answer that uh, best uh, suits you. As a start, we will... Uh, try to define sustainability and what it means to us. So I'd like to ask uh, the panel members here today if you wish to explain what the term sustainability is and what it means to someone. In a few words, how would you define it? Thank you. Hello, everyone. It's really a great pleasure to be here uh, and to be able to discuss sustainability, cultural colonialism, and design. So sustainability, when we think about sustainability, um, one of the main definitions that comes across is really how to meet the requirements of the current generation and not compromise the, gener the, the needs of the future generations at the same time. And usually when we think of sustainability, we limit it a bit to environmental sustainability, which is a pity, because when we look at sustainability, we need to look at the economic aspect, the social aspect, and the environmental aspect at the same time. We cannot meet the future needs, the needs of the future generations if we look at one aspect at a time. So that's why sustainability, for me, needs to be a triangle of those three elements, which is social, economic, and at the same time environment, and that's what can help us actually in defining what can we do as designers in the sustainable field. Good evening, Good evening everyone. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you for coming. Uh, I would like to also uh, add to uh, the sustainability definition uh, the notion of uh, need, uh, whether something is needed to be done or not, uh, as uh, an initial question that one would ask when uh, a project arises, uh, and the notion of impact, of course, uh, in terms of uh, resources and in terms of the consequences of the use of resources. Um, how much is left after the intervention has happened? How much does it take to run the intervention? Uh, what is its impact uh, at different levels of, uh, of the environment? I'll, I just want to add a few points, which uh, mostly build up on what Sarah said and also Karim, in the sense where sustainability is not just material, but it also extends to uh, things that could be a little more abstract, such as thoughts and practices. Uh, but And also, it's not uh, particularly or exclusive to the work of designers. It's uh, a social practice that uh, encompasses the, the whole community and society, and it's a, a circular... Uh, uh, it's a circular practice which not only involves these people, but also uh, triggers them to continue with this path. Yeah, thank you. Um, so um, thank you for those who are joining our uh, live uh, poll on slido.com. So again, I just would like to remind you that you can enter the website slido.com and just add the number that's on the screen. It's triple five one five nine four four. And you can also give us uh, your own definition of what sustainability may mean to you. Um, Sarah, I'd also like to ask you, um, in reality, how do you think architects can claim truly that they are tackling sustainable design in Lebanon? Sarah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> sure. So uh, basically, I mean, if we look again at the three aspects and, and we understand each one of them, I mean, we can obviously tackle sustainability through different uh, elements in our design. The first 
part being the environmental part. It's really important that we think of systems that can actually ensure the sustainability of the project in preserving the environment it is in. Also, there's a lot of practices in, in, and technologies that were invested in, in, in past and in, in previous architecture, especially in vernacular architecture, that we can use and get inspired by to actually create products or create, whether it's a brick wall that or, 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 or a wall, or is it if it's a north dock that actually creates, or a wind catcher. There's a lot of technologies that we can use to make sure that we have a thermal and com comfortable area for people to live in, which will affect eventually the well-being of people. There's also a part which is really important, it's that uh, what we do in design will affect the behavior of people. Because if they feel that through very minimal materials or local resources or materials that are around them, we can build a sustainable space uh, and a space that is actually comfortable in terms of visual comfort, in terms of social thermal comfort, that would create also a, a, a change in the mindset of people and in their behaviors in actually using the space and having some ownership of their s over the space. Now, if we think again on the economic level, as Karim mentioned, I mean, the life cycle of the project, the operation of the project is really important. And then that goes since the start of the conception of the project till the end, till when we actually demolish the project or it's not there anymore. Because what happens to structures after they stay and we can't actually use them anymore? Do we reuse them? I mean, obviously in the world, there's a lot of adaptive reuse now. So that's a very trendy topic, but at the same time, it's very useful and it's a need. And that's why people are actually looking at those structures. And the last point is social sustainability. When we look at social sustainability and well-being of human beings, which is also coming up a lot here in, in the Slido, we can see that uh, what we do will affect communities. And to make it for communities, we need to understand what they need and, and how we can actually respond to their needs. So our design needs to be relevant for them since the start till the end. And it needs to be also tailored to their own uh, needs. And I can, for example, give an example of a project that we did uh, after the Beirut blast, for example, uh, which is called Crossing Together. We went there and we wanted to create a community center with partners to actually create a space that opens up to people. And the idea was to create, I mean, with our partners, was just to create a space to actually serve people food because they needed food at that point. But what we wanted to create was a space that would last longer, that would actually make people come to the space, gather together, especially the elderly in Rimail, which are actually not really taken care of. And when they sit together, when they play together some, some board games, when they talk to each other, drink some coffee, then eventually they will bond together and they will make the space their own and they will get the support without begging, begging for support, without feeling that they're not dignified when they get the support. So this space crossing together till now is being used by people and people feel ownership over the space. They cannot let it go. They come there, they love it. It's their place, it's their identity. So that's another way also to make sure that sustainability is linked to the social needs and is responding according to its program, to the space that we create, to the social needs that we see. Yes, this is very much needed. So uh, again, uh, I'd just like to go over some of the results that have been showing up for the definition of sustainability. Uh, basically, the options that we gave are whether sustainability means social well-being, an individual daily lifestyle, reusing natural resources and materials, economic growth, or applying design thinking to businesses. And uh, so far, like 58% agree that it's all of, all of these inclusive, inclusively. Now, moving a bit to, since our talk today is about sustainability, but in the context of cultural colonialism, it's important to also understand what colonialism really means. So colonialism, if defined, um, is known as the policy or practice of acquiring full or partial control, political control over another country, occupying it with settlers, and somehow exploiting it economically. The term colony comes from the Latin word colonus, which means farmer. And this word reminds us that the practice of colonialism usually involved in the past the transfer of population to a new territory where the arrival arrivals lived as permanent settlers while maintaining political alle allegiance to their original country or country of origin. So to somehow give a bit of uh, historical perspective when it comes to Lebanon, uh, going back in time, back when it didn't even exist yet as a country, there was the what is known as the Mutasarifiya, or what, what we can translate as the di uh, district 
uh, in the Ottoman Empire. And after that, new lands were added and a new demographic reality emerged. Despite this, Lebanon having never, never before existed at that time was uh, France's success. And with dreams of making Lebanon part of uh, l'Union Française, the French crafted the Lebanese system based on the French one back then. And after that, the Lebanese, of course, became, began calling for uh, independence, which was then declared in 1943, as we all know. And the basis for the country's current dilemma was set from back then. Now, the sustainability issues, or let's say the lack of sustainability, which we are dealing with today in the uh, cultural and creative industries in Lebanon, is not really is not the how the artist um, or makers and designers actually create. It's not the innovation that's the problem. The actual problem revolves around the variety and choice of resources or materials uh, which are available for us to work with as designers and artists. And the issue is in the policies of our ex-colonial and current uh, legis legislators, not the design process itself. And we know that to achieve sustainability, we need to identify and discuss colonialism even, even more throughout its layers. And to understand the political and especially the cultural implications of colonialism, we must first understand where it actually began. And knowing that the materials and resources were and still are colonial power dynamic tools and vantage points. So I'd like to ask our panel uh, today, panel members, how do you define in your own way cultural colonialism? Philippa. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm not a b very big fan of using the term colonialism because it's not only about this uh, uh, imperialist powers which were taking over the world at, the t uh, at this moment anymore. Um, it's it w I would consider it a little bit outdated in the sense where it means that we are not looking at uh, the market dynamics which are still uh, very occurring. Uh, where in a sense where neoliberalism is this new approach to where globalization and colonialism has turned from being political influences and this uh, overtaking resources into dominating the world and trying to create it as this universal entity where we still feel the domination of particular uh, power while others are being left out of this uh, or being marginalized of this uh, center. And uh, so from this perspective, I feel that uh, understanding colonialism is also an understanding of the market dynamics, where resources are put in places more than in others. But it also means that uh, it's not just about, so culture is uh, uh, a derivation of how this, this exploitation is being uh, done. Right, and how, how do you think your definition of sustainability uh, changes? within the context of cultural colonialism. Karim. It's complicated, your questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to comment on the notion of uh, colonialism first. Sure. Uh, because um, th there is this uh, uh, random, there's this random notion that uh, human beings uh, live in separate containers, uh, which is a very random idea. Uh, so basically you define a country by its legal borders, and then once you cross this border, you start to need a visa or something. Um, but the reality is that human beings are human beings, and uh, the planet is a planet, it's one planet. Uh, so uh, I would say the, the, the end game of, uh, of this issue is um, to understand that we live in one planet and, and that globalization has very positive aspects, which is that we can exchange things which we don't have so, so that we will be able to produce certain things out of resources that we don't have. The problem today um, 
you all know that we are going to become a gas producing <laughs> <laughs> country. <laughs> uh, is that there is an ill intention somewhere uh, in terms of who is going to benefit more from whose resources, which reproduces the question of colonialism in so many new ways, including within the country. I, I think there are issues of colonialism within Lebanon as well, between factions and factions. So I think it boils down more to a, a notion of intention and lack of love and lack of seeing others as part of yourself. This is, I think, the beginning of the definition that, that you're talking about. And uh, if we don't notice this uh, quite urgently, uh, there is an issue, which is that th the whole planet you know, can go into, uh, into apocalyptic scenarios of non-sustainability. Uh, so uh, we, ha we have to notice very quickly uh, how uh, we are producing conflict out of uh, those notions of boundaries. Another one which is very blatant right now is uh, R Russia invading Ukraine and all the ramifications of uh, what it means. Um, and I mean, and whether we're gonna stop <laughs> having this attitude soon, or we're gonna continue uh, this uh, this old-fashioned way of of looking at uh, the world as a, as a, as a division of of groups of people, uh, and the consequences of that. Right, Karim. But don't you think um, when we start thinking about the world as one planet? Um, the the access to resources might not work the same. Yes, the access to resources is not equally divided, and the division of populations around the planet is not equal as well. Uh, and uh, and this is where the problem lies. Of course, I mean we need to find ways uh, to to rebalance the exchanges, the economical exchanges, so that they are. Uh, less based on uh, pure profitability and competition, uh, but rather on, uh, again, what is needed. You know, there needs to be the production of energy. I mean, this is the bottom line. You have, the more you have people in a planet, the more you need to produce energy. Currently, the essential source of energy is fossil fuels. Uh, also, many countries are starting to move towards uh, very high percentages of non-fossil fuels uh, so sources of energy. I was in Portugal recently, and they have 60% of their energy produced from uh, hydroelectricity and other renewable sources, and only 40%, actually 20%, uh, only is produced from fossil fuels. Um, it's amazing, you know, how they are using simply the, uh, the rivers. Um, so... Uh, so this question of how, to, how do we divide the, the resources in a way that becomes more equitable and less competitive is also linked to this change of attitude, which needs to happen soon. Yeah. Um, so when it comes to uh, whether we have access or no access to materials, Philippa, I'd like to um, ask you with regards to your curated project, if you could tell us more about it. Uh, yeah, so basically it's a curatorial platform uh, on which uh, we feature and document uh, several uh, public interventions which take place in the space of cities. And in this particular edition, first attempt to that, uh, it happens in Beirut. Uh, and so the idea is to uh, produce these works uh, where we rethink, first of all, the way we produce art as uh, artists, but also as collectives, as curators, and as contributors, uh, to think of how to exist or produce outside of the realm of the institution, uh, which also means to think of the sustainable ways of doing so, uh, be it in the access to material, but also in the access to 
financing the projects, uh, which allows also other producers to be integrated in this uh, network of uh, production. Uh, it also involves uh, the reappropriation of art as uh, a political, uh, I might call it tool, but uh, it's not really a tool because it doesn't actually apply change, but rather it uh, instigates and triggers this uh, normalized uh, life that we are part of, uh, where it uh, highlights things that we uh, within a particular present. Uh, and so this is a little abstractly explained. Uh, but uh, anyway, so we've done three interventions so far. Uh, one was a screening, uh, which happened on the Vendôme stairs, uh, and which uh, in a way was um, a, a way of uh, looking at this gentrified stairs, but also in a way of uh, giving the residents of this neighborhood a platform uh, to engage with, this, with these uh, screened uh, films. Um, there's also a walk that we did with Petra Serhal uh, through uh, all around the city where she tells the story of Beirut, uh, but from this mixture of uh, fiction and reality and where we engage with the spaces uh, after the blast. And the third one is a performance with Hashem Adnan, which took place in front of the Quarantina Public Park, which happened to be closed for the public. Uh, and for some reason, originally, actually, we had the plan to do the performance there. But when we realized that uh, the only access is uh, by either the state or so the municipality or by uh, being an NGO, uh, doing it inside, it meant uh, us being either com like uh, it's we're uh, we're just complying by the normative uh, practices, uh, which is why doing it outside of it was a sort of protest against this uh, conform uh, conformed rule. Uh, and so we've we're developing also it's uh, so the project is also part of uh, Be Public, which is an urban lab. Uh, founded by Rana Haddad, and we're trying to work on several interventions which will continue ongoingly. And you have a website, right? For yes. It's uh uh, not an exhibition.com. Yeah, so it's not an exhibition.com. If you would like to uh, read more about uh, Philippa's uh, curated project. So, uh, with regards to materials, uh, the essential issue is that of access or no access, right, to the resources and materials for designers in Lebanon and the region. Um, do you think there are specific reasons behind the access or no access to the materials? The reasons that you could think of, or maybe main reasons? I wouldn't say it's about access or no access to materials only. It's about looking properly and seeing if they're there first before coming up and saying, I want to buy something that is a product which is made already in a different uh, country or a different territory or a different place. So it's really about also Sometimes we have the materials we just don't realize. We can actually use them through a new technology or an innovative technology or, or, or a vernacular technology <laughs> that is old, actually, and actually use it in a way that can actually achieve the goal that we want. And that's our, our struggle here. I mean, talking about colonialism and talking about more globalization, I would say, today. I mean, there's no differences in territories as much as before, and there's a connection between people that is tremendous now across the whole world. So our exchanges are, are all over me the media and we can actually connect to everywhere. And we can see so many Chinese products that are advertised in Lebanon that you can buy in an instant or, or US products or whatever, I mean, whatever in the world. And now what we need to do is to, instead of buying a double glazing, for example, uh, system that can allow us to have a thermal comfort within a building, we could actually maybe think of a system that can do the same and achieve the same objective by using existing windows or using an old technology, which is about ha having insulated walls as well, for example, and having uh, double like uh, or the orientation of the building in the right direction as well to the wind. So there's also um, a limitation in what we see sometimes and what we don't see, uh, which can help us a lot in thinking a bit innovatively in the way we can reuse what we have and benefit from what the, the, the technologies and the craftsmanship that we have. Right, and do you think sometimes we are able to replace the materials that we don't find? I think we are good with doing that in, 
in, in, in, uh, we can. In I mean, to say that Lebanon can produce all the materials in the world, no. no. I mean, we're limited in, 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 in size yeah. and resources and everything. But we can, of course, try to achieve some goals by using what's there and by getting inspired and using this globalization to actually research, to learn about materials, mm -hmm. to see what's there, what can we do, and then use them and implement them in the way that could be addressed to the culture and the local needs here and to the climate here, because it's different than anywhere in the world again. And every single project needs to address the direct context that's around and it that surround it, surrounds exactly. it. Exactly, yeah. Um, Karim, in the past, perhaps we had uh, way more organic ways of doing things. and. This was somehow disturbed. From your experience in Lebanon, um, why is there a lack of sustainability when it comes to production? Is it because some materials were not produced locally, because we have lesser means? Uh, what's your thoughts on that? What are your thoughts on that? It's a complicated uh, question because uh, <laughs> basically, the moment uh, you go more than one floor. Uh, automatically you start to need certain structural systems uh, which uh, are difficult to achieve by the vernacular, uh, like uh, in stone construction or in uh, stone and wood construction or in mud construction, which are the, the traditions of Lebanon. You can go so much high and that's it. Um, so you need automatically something that has uh, strong uh, tensile qualities uh, such as metal. Uh, or the combination of metal inside concrete, which is the uh, most common way of building in Lebanon. So, so automatically when you go to urban contexts uh, where we are building 5, 6, 10, 20, 30, 40 floors, um, uh, which is allowed by the law. So I mean, I, I'm saying that people are following the law. If, if the law doesn't allow this, then it would be a different ball game. But since the, the law allows uh, to go uh, that high, automatically you, you need to have um, other types of materials. We do produce cement in Lebanon. Uh, as you know, the production of cement is, uh, is polluting, but it's local. Uh, the steel that you put inside the concrete, you have to import it. Uh, so automatically there's a certain amount of uh, carbon footprint that comes with importing the steel. Building in wood is out of the question in Lebanon because we don't have any more uh, sustainable forest or forests altogether to, to bring wood from. Uh, building in stone and, uh, and earth uh, is possible. Uh, of course, stone uh, quarries have also um, uh, environmental uh, impact. And uh, and Earth has limitations uh, in terms of uh, the, the the structural capacities, but also in terms of the durability. You have to protect uh, the wall if you want to 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 build it with uh, with mud. Uh, so uh, every action has a consequence, like they say in yoga. <laughs> so uh, a anything that you want to do uh, has to uh, has to to use something. Um, we need laws, that's for sure. I, d I don't think that the laws are just um, a local problem. I would, say I would say you need a global bylaws that will push more uh, towards uh, using uh, less polluting uh, products. In particular, we need laws about fossil fuels, which are right now uh, the uh, most polluting uh, issue in the world, and it's not just in construction, it's uh, in transportation and mostly in industry. It's, it is the industries which are uh, using fossil fuels, which are uh, very big polluters. <coughs> and I mean, Lebanon is nothing. I mean, the big polluters are uh, China, the United States, and so on and so forth. So I mean, again, if we look globally at, at things, uh, uh, we can be very sustainable uh, at our small scale, but it is at the level of big decisions that um, things are going to make a difference. Um, to go back to your question about Lebanon and the, the lack of resources, I mean, it is the, uh, naturally the result of the small scale of the country. I mean, uh, Russia is a huge country. It has uh, most of all the resources that, are, that exist because of this, uh, this huge territory. Lebanon is a very small country. It should be more understood as, a, as part of a regional uh, zone, uh, which would include, I don't know, uh, uh, Syria, Israel, Turkey, and so on and so forth. We're starting to make uh, steps. 
uh, towards becoming more of a region and less of a, of a group of uh, separate countries. We should develop uh, uh, systems of transportation, like uh, railroads, uh, that would uh, reduce the use of, uh, of airplanes, um, so that we can transport things uh, around and so that we can have access to uh, uh, to materials. I mean, the question is really very big. It's it's really endless. But I mean, th that's just you know uh, a beginning of of reflection on the issues. Right. Um, so now that we're talking about cultural colonialism, um, also we're having this talk in English, right? Not in Arabic. And this is because this is being streamed, and this is where positively somehow globalization comes to play. Um, Philippa, I'd like to ask you, you know, as a graphic designer, uh, in the past, maybe designers in Lebanon, as designers, we used to uh, work so much with Latin type more than Arabic type. And now we feel uh, there's more like this return to calligraphy and the interest in Arabic type, not only in Lebanon, but uh, perhaps uh, in the West as well. How do you think um, this fact, how do you think, like, not colonialism, but this type of globalization helped us as graphic designers and professionals? How do you view this? Uh, well, I'm not sure that whatever I will say will answer your it's question, okay. but fine. I think that it takes parts, parts of what you've said. Um, I disagree on the fact that in the past we've been using Latin more than Arabic, because for the longest time Arabic was actually predominant over Latin because we've had this uh, need to uh, communicate to the local people. So uh, the posters, the logos were done for the ones who can read Arabic, uh, but not until uh, uh, later, so in the past few decades, uh, where we've had this need to communicate to the West as well, where we, d where, where we started incorporating the translations. Um, I'm not trying to create a historical timeline here, uh, but uh, there is also this way, this uh, return of the Arabic language uh, at the moment, which is a little uh, predominant, not only in Lebanon, but also in the region, uh, where Arabic is used a little more of as an aesthetic and as uh, a visual component rather than uh, uh, content-based. Um, and so it goes back to the idea where we spe when we speak of culture, we're not only speaking of how we produce visuals, but visuals are very much connected to the production of knowledge, but also the, produc the production of content. And so when we produce in Arabic, we're also producing knowledge and content, uh, which is why the interest is when we do so, we are, may we are producing books in Arabic, uh, which do connect with the actual culture of the region. Sarah, would you like to add something about this, knowing that you also come from a visual design background sure I mean uh, I, I mean again I mean I wouldn't see it as a barrier I mean having a certain language that we use more than the other it's again about connections about sharing about exchanges and it helps in 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 I mean English today helps in connecting different worlds it doesn't mean that we shouldn't look at uh, languages that are different than English and try to see what what this language is connected to and what does it say in terms of culture because the language is part of the culture and it does, I mean, the way we speak, the structure of the sentences, everything that we do is related to the language that we speak uh, and to the culture where, where we live. So basically we need to really um, understand a bit more uh, outside of the box and not look at the language as one element, but more of a system of elements that actually constitute a culture. And uh, it's the same, I mean, when we look at materials, it's the same when we look at people, it's the same when we look at the traditions, how they actually, um, work and, 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 and behave and, and live. And that's what affects a lot architecture, for example. Because looking at people and looking how they actually live and what they do in their day and how they actually prefer to go from one place to the other, what's the, the, the their preferred uh, places where, where they position themselves, where they stay, where they live, where they sleep. I mean, all this is also related to uh, what we design. We design for people. We design for people and with people to understand exactly their needs and to, to tailor the design to what what is important for them. And people in Lebanon or maybe in the north would not be maybe 
living and behaving the same way as people in Beirut or in people in the Bekaa and rural areas and, and non-rural areas and urban areas are very different from each other and that. So that's why we need to, again, look at, at maybe the general vision for understanding a bit the, the, the larger scope, but also go in the details and really design and look at what can affect the person and how we can actually design in a human-centered manner uh, for people. Right, Karim. Yeah, I would like to elaborate uh, on this point. Um, we definitely live in a globalized uh, situation. In particular, in Lebanon, we are sort of uh, uh, a identity, a hybrid, uh, which uh, is the result of this crossroads uh, geographical situation in which we live. Um, I mean, I was uh, educated in French in the lycée. I was then educated in the American University of Beirut in English. Then I went to, to the United States. When I went to the United States, I felt suddenly very Lebanese, uh, uh, which I hadn't felt well.